my talk is about locally network risk and how to respond. I'd like to start with the great civilizations of fact, like the Egyptians. What was so special about them? We've been fascinated all the time at school and ever since. They came up with inventions that lasted for 2,000 years or more, even 5,000 years, like invention of paper, writing, mirrors, glasses, or even beer, something which is maybe the most important invention among those for some people. Or take China, who, which invented porcelain, gunpowder, compasses, printing, or silk. Or take Greece, which came up uh, with, among others, philosophy and democracy, or the Roman Empire that invented cement or paved roads, bridge construction, or Roman law, which is basically still what our law is built on. So what among the inventions that we're making these days will last for 2,000 years or 5,000 years? How well are we doing, in fact? And if you're looking at the kind of problems we're facing, it seems we're not doing very well. We're facing financial, economic, and debt crisis, social and political instabilities, global warming, environmental change, organized crime, exploding cybercrime, or a quick spreading of emerging diseases, just entering the flu season. And what is the reason for this? Why are we facing so many problems? One of the reasons, I believe, is that we're networking everything. Of course, that comes with a lot of benefits, like a global exchange of people, money, goods, information, and ideas. Many new services have been produced for us, so we don't want to miss this. But at the same time, network infrastructures also create pathways for disaster spreading. <coughs> Here is an example from November 4, 2006, when the European power grid basically folded. We had a blackout all over Europe in many places. We can see the complex pattern of this blackout. It's very hard to predict. And this shows you which kind of difficulties we're facing when looking at complex network systems. I'm also showing you this wonderful movie that has been produced by Frank Weiser's team in the Fox project, and it shows you another cascading effect, uh, bankruptcies in the United States as a result of Lehman Brothers default. That's quite concerning because hundreds of banks have defaulted actually within a few years, and it has created losses of hundreds of billions of dollars. So what's the reason for this? And in fact, that was a question that Her Majesty, the Queen of England, was asking to members of the London School of Economics. And they were quite surprised by this question and couldn't uh, answer it right away. So. What are you doing in such a case? Well, you come up with a workshop like this one in order to address a question like she was asking, namely, why had nobody noticed that the credit crunch was on its way? So where was the problem? And after some discussions and analysis, the conclusion was the failure was to see how collectively a number of imbalances in the system added up to a series of interconnected imbalances over which no single authority had jurisdiction. Everybody seemed to be doing their own job properly and on its own merit, but individual risk might rightly have been viewed as small, while the risk to the system as a whole was vast. And also have a look at the closing formula, which I like very much over here. So is this possible, in fact, that nobody is responsible for the financial crisis? Everybody was doing a good job, and still we have a big problem. We have huge debts now in 
many countries and no idea how to pay them back within the next 10, 20 years. Well, in fact, I'd like to argue it's possible that there are these kinds of phenomena where small perturbations <coughs> actually cause a systemic impact that nobody wants to happen. Have a look at this situation over here where drivers are supposed to drive in a circle, not to stop, not to have any accidents, and for some time it works quite well. Not a very difficult task. But as you see, from time to time there's perturbations in the flow, and those cause actually a phantom traffic jam. Now the question is, what causes this phantom traffic jam? And if you would ask the drivers, they would probably say, well, there was a stupid driver in front of me who didn't know how to drive a car. But all of them have been educated. They have a driver's license. They have actually a good view. That means all the data that they seem to need. They have good technology and certainly not the intentions to stop. So why then is it happening? Well, in mathematics, we've learned, actually, that beyond a certain density, small perturbations in the velocity would be amplified through a cascade effect. That means one driver slows down a little bit, the next one responds with a delay. And in order to compensate for the delay, you would have to tip the brake a little bit stronger. And the next one, even stronger. And again, stronger. So that causes a cascade effect where finally drivers have to stop, although nobody wants to do this. For me, this is a prime example for a systemic instability, where things will go up wrong sooner or later, even if you have all the data that you think you need, the best technology and the best intentions. Now the question is, what implications does the networking have on the world? And we've been looking here at the social dilemma situation where it would be good if everybody cooperated, but if everybody else cooperates and you don't, there is an extra benefit for you which creates a temptation for you not to cooperate. And so cooperation turns out to be unstable like the free traffic flow, cooperation tends to erode and break down and lead to a tragedy of the commons. How to overcome this tragedy of the commons? Well, it turns out that neighborhood interactions can actually stabilize cooperation. And here, so you see, if we start with the situation where everybody is interacting with neighbors, and then we add links, shortcuts, randomly in the system, more and more over time. And what you see is that in the beginning, cooperation increased largely. So let's go on networking. It's good. And it increases further. But there is a point where eventually further networking reduces the level of cooperation. And eventually it erodes. And we end up in a tragedy. Here is a simulation of such a scenario. Red is non-cooperative behavior, blue is cooperative behavior. We start with almost oh, everybody being non-cooperative, but you can see the neighborhood interactions are actually promoting cooperation quite a lot. And eventually then we are adding links. few first and then more and more still a lot of cooperation everything is fine but now already it turns quite reddish you can see and it's something that you don't want to happen so there is a level of networking which turns out to be not good for the system and in fact as L.D. Heldeck from the Bank of England has shown the interconnectivity between banks in the financial network 
has increased largely from 1985 to 1995 to 2005. And so was that perhaps the root cause of the financial meltdown? Is it a cooperation problem? That's something that we certainly need to ask ourselves because you wouldn't expect an increasing amount of networking to pose a serious danger for our world, but maybe we need to pay more attention to such kinds of possibilities. In fact, if several different kinds of systems are interconnected, I mean, if you have networks of networks or hyperconnected systems, then those systems are now to be even more vulnerable to perturbations. So, the World Economic Forum here is talking about the possibility of a perfect storm where a problem in one system would create problems in other systems. <coughs> and the underlying issue here is that we have a combination of network interactions with stochastic effects. That means the impact of randomness on the system. Both components and links may fail with a certain probability. And, and what I'm suggesting here is that the combination of such probabilistic failure, which is often called risk, and complexity creates uncertainty. That means basically the impossibility to predict what will be the outcome. In fact, the same cause in such a scenario can have different effects different causes can have the same effects. Those effects also happen with a certain delay, so it's very difficult actually to figure out the causal relationships in the system. And we may not notice those interdependencies because it's so difficult really to reveal those interdependencies. A concerning question is whether this networking of the world has unintentionally created something like a global time bomb, an unstable system which might get out of control. And in fact, Warren Buffett, one of the richest people on earth, he, he must know something about how the world works, apparently, has actually warned about an investment time bomb some time back. That was in 2003. And we know it has exploded five years later. And we're still struggling with uh, the result of this because the cascade effect doesn't seem to have fully stopped. And uh, we don't know what will be the eventual outcome of this crisis. But these kind of cascade effects also happen actually on short time scales. Here is an example. The flash crash of May 6, 2010 has melted away $600 billion within just a few minutes. And people were shocked. Fortunately, that was uh, not just before the market closed down, because otherwise that could have been the end of financial markets. So there was time for the market to recover. But it was a big surprise, by the way, not the only flash crash. It took six months to analyze the courses of this. People thought there must have been an um, error in the algorithms or a, a human error or a criminal actor or something. But none of this was true. It was a cascade effect. Because 70% of trades are now done by computers. So some trades triggered off other trades, and then eventually it created this meltdown. So maybe we should imagine the world to be working like this, where one event is triggering other events, <laughs> in a positive or negative sense, but can have actually a global impact. Of course, that's a very small system over here. Now maybe we should uh, more imagine it like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And if you think now your calving is exaggerating, then you should have a look at this movie over here, which is about the Spanish Revolution a few years back when the financial crisis hit Spain. <laughs> and this is looking at tweets between different cities. And it looks very much like those table tennis balls that I have shown you before. So maybe it's not the worst way to imagine how the world of today is working. <coughs> the question is, what can we do about it? Certainly, we need to decide <coughs> in a particular way. We need to be able to stop cascade effects if these have negative impacts on our system, if they can damage or destroy the system itself. And in fact, we know how to do that, at least in electrical systems. Everybody has these kinds of electrical fuses at home to make sure that if there is a, a local perturbation, a local overload, your house wouldn't burn down. And engineers know how to build in breaking points in places where the damage wouldn't be big. Like in a car, you built in a crash zone. Because human life is more important to save than the car. The question, therefore, is how could you design a financial architecture that has financial fuses built in? It's kind of shocking that we have had many financial crises over the past centuries, but apparently we're still not prepared for it. We still don't have those fuses in the system, otherwise what seems to be an uh, American problem in the real estate market couldn't have become a worldwide problem. There are some things that we can do to counter, actually, the increasing instability of systems. There are a number of factors that drive this instability, such as reducing redundancies to save money, to be more cost efficient, uh, more networking, higher complexity, <laughs> faster dynamics, and also innovations that we don't understand might pose a problem. But we can build backup strategies, have plan Bs, we can have redundancies, uh, contingency plans, we can have st stabilizing real-time feedback, we can have um, diversity, we can reduce connectivity, or we can introduce dynamic decoupling strategies, and many other things that I'd also like to mention actually that transparency, accountability, responsibility and awareness are important things to consider. So we can do something. It's not like a natural disaster that strikes and our society has to suffer from this. No, it's man-made problems and mistakes and we have to pay a high price for it. We have now new opportunities at our hands with uh, the rise of big data. We have data about technologies, about human activity patterns, about society and economies. So what can we do with it? Actually, we are just entering the age of the Internet of Things. There will be centers distributed all around us. They can measure everything that you imagine. It will be there in a few years. And so the question is, what can we do with it? And I'd like to say we can craft new instruments to explore the world. And not just to measure things in different ways that we can measure today, like temperature and traffic jams and all these kinds of things. We can measure other things, like social capital, level of cooperation, trust, satisfaction, things that basically determine the fabric of society, 
which we don't see and don't understand, but we can damage it. And we need to protect it, so we need to learn how to measure it, and I think it's becoming possible now. So that's why Future ICT was proposing to come up with a number of new measurement instruments and platforms. First of all, the planetary nervous system. That would use those sensor networks and the internet to collect data in order to get a real-time picture about the state of the world. The physical world, the environment, social activities, economic activities, and so on. And that could be used to create awareness of some of the problems that we have in the world and opportunities that are around the corner and that we don't see yet. But we could also feed these data into what we call a living earth simulator that would use models to look at what if scenarios would be developed like we developed weather forecasts in the past. We know they don't have a long-term reliability, they're probabilistic, but they're useful. Every single Swiss franc that we invest into weather forecasting creates a benefit five times higher. It takes some time to develop such kind of systems, <coughs> and certainly we cannot fully rely on these kind of systems, but they're useful. So let's build them. As compared to the cost that all of those crises that I was mentioning before are causing, this would be very cheap. And finally, we want to open this up actually for everybody. The information age should create not just a benefit for governments and businesses, but for everybody. So let's open it up. It could work like an app store, a platform where you can upload data and models and opinions, ratings, all of this, and everybody else could use it for free or for a fee. So it would empower people to use data and come up with new companies, consultancies, and whatsoever. What it takes is data, so we need to create an information ecosystem for this. And in fact, I think the planetary nervous system is going forward. If you buy this beautiful book, The Human Phase of Big Data, and open it, then the foreword has this title, A Planetary Nervous System. This book was sent to 10,000 key decision makers in the world. So I think the Internet of Things will be used to build this planetary nervous system that Future ICT has propo been proposing. And this is how you can imagine it to work. So there's a lot of information out there in the Internet, millions of pictures that people have taken, and you can basically use these pictures and figure out where have the photographers been standing, where have the cameras been pointing, and put all those pictures together to reconstruct the world outside in 3D. So you can do that basically with your computer at your desk. You don't have to leave it in your office for this. And you can do it with almost any place in the world where there is just enough photographs taken by other people. And in fact, you know, everybody almost today is using smartphones. Smartphones have about 10 different sensors in them. You know, we could use them to collect information about the world. That, however, should be self-determined. That means we should give control to the users over those kinds of data. And then we could build an observatory for financial instabilities like DDS and that, for example, is doing it. Or we could uh, build actually observatories that would uh, inform us about health risk, about epidemic spreading. Or we could actually also come up with observatories that warn us of upcoming conflicts or possible wars. In fact, we've been able to measure international tension and it has a surprising level of predictability for war, so that can be very helpful as well. Now, the question is, what are we doing with these kinds of data once we are having that? How do we govern and manage the world? And this 
video review that I took in Cairo some years back is kind of suggesting that self-regulation could work. It's a highly diverse system, but people almost <laughs> never have to <laughs> And there is a trick here in this design, which is we have a unidirectional road over here, a unidirectional road over there, and a buffer between those two roads that allows people to adjust their speed such that they arrive just in the moment when there is a gap opening up in the flow. So it's a design issue, basically, that we need to master in order to allow systems to self-organize and self-regulate. <coughs> And uh, here is an example how we succeeded to come up with a system that can overcome traffic jams. So let us first simulate how traffic jams come about, so the annoying stop and go waves. And uh, we have a very special car over here because it can be turned into a helicopter. It does uh, allow us to escape the traffic jam, but also to see what is the reason for this traffic jam. So I'm fed up with this traffic jam, now I'm lifting up my car. And we can see that actually there are a few small perturbations over here at this on-ramp, created by cars that want to enter the freeway. And that causes these amplification effects that finally create the stop and go waves. Now we are accelerating the presentation, but the inflow stays the same all the time. And we're turning on a traffic system system which is based on radar sensors in the cars that measure distances and relative velocities and allows the car to drive automatically, but in a way that is superior to human driving and stabilizes the flow and increases the capacity. So you see that after some time we get rid of the traffic jam. So if the interactions are causing the trouble, then we need to change the interactions. That's mechanism design. <coughs> and so the question is, would this old dream of a self-regulating economy in society become possible with all these data that are now becoming available? So that has been inspired at least 300 years ago. The table of bees is basically suggesting um, a beehive is like a society. It's beautifully self-organized. Well, there is a queen, but the queen is basically not telling any bee what to do. So it's really based on simple rules that create the wonderful organization. And of course, Adam Smith has taken it up and uh, said, if everybody is just doing what is best for himself, that uh, would also create the best outcome for our economy and society. And he called it the invisible hand kind of phenomenon. Well, the question is, is it really working? And sometimes, yes. Look, over here, we have those pedestrians that manage to self-regulate, self-organize, in a way that separates the different directions of motion and creates a very efficient flow, automatically, without a policeman, without laws regulating this. You know, it happens even without conscious uh, planning. However, unfortunately, it doesn't always work like this. As we've seen during the tragic love break disaster in Duisburg and elsewhere, so, if the system is driven towards its limits, then coordination breaks down. And we know this problem also from the many tragedies of the commons, like environmental exploitation, environmental pollution, overfishing, global warming. Since hundreds of years are we struggling with these kinds of problems, despite all our best technology and science. How is it possible? Have we learned how to solve these problems? Well, there is an approach which is, as the market is not solving it in a bottom-up way, 
politics comes in and regu regulates it top down. We have tens of thousands of laws or hundreds of new laws every year, and we need to enforce them. And uh, that works reasonably well, but it's costly. And by now, most industrialized countries have more than 100% GDP of public debt. Uh, we're now looking at the U United States of America with concern because oh, they're at the verge of bankruptcy, and actually many countries in the European Union as well, and Japan. So can we go on like this, or do we need a new approach? Maybe we should listen to Albert Einstein, who said we cannot solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. But is there another approach? Well, I do think, yes, there is. We have a third alternative. We've had centrally planned economies where the organization has been in a top-down way and regulation as well, and they were not very efficient. Uh, we turn to conventional market economies where organization happens fast enough, but there is a top-down regulation. In some sense, uh, the market bottom-up organization and uh, political top-down organization struggle all the time with each other, and it creates a lot of friction. It's very costly as well, so there is inefficiency. So couldn't we get rid of this inefficiency by turning also towards bottom-up regulation. Can we learn how to design systems so they would self-regulate? And I call this a participatory market society, and it seems to be important that we would have other regarding decision-making and not just self-regarding decision-making. So the homo socialis that I introduced over here is conditionally cooperative, but takes self-determined decisions. But he takes into account the impact of those decisions on others. And interestingly enough, that reaches better outcomes. I mean, the homo socialis can overcome tragedies of the commons, for example. And I'd like uh, to demonstrate here an example that we have studied <coughs> at length, where we look at these three ways of organizing a complex system. Urban traffic flow, where we have competition for space. We cannot serve everybody's demand at the same time, very similar to an economic system. And today, we have something like a top-down regulation approach. We have a central traffic control authority that collects data from all over the city and then tries to come up with the best possible control, like a benevolent dictator, and implements this. The problem is traffic flow is largely varying, so planning doesn't work because the predictability <coughs> of your planning is not very reliable. So let's look at two other ways of organization, like the bottom-up self-organization where we minimize travel time at each intersection. Not very complicated. It's like your homo economicus, you know, you do the best thing you can do as an intersection. Um, and we look at bottom-up self-regulation, where we also try to do the same thing, but <coughs> with an eye on the neighbors. I mean, we try to coordinate with neighboring intersections, and that's why we call it other regarding or like a homo socialis. And let's have a look at the performance of these three ways of governing the system. This shows the Q length as a function of the capacity utilization of the intersection. And the top-down regulation does reasonably well. But uh, selfish optimization of the homo economicus uh, creates a self-organization which is much superior, much shorter queues. Unfortunately, however, the invisible hand of Adam Smith only work up to here, because then we have exploding queue lengths, so there's a coordination problem, and Adam Smith's invisible hand fails 
here at high capacity utilizations. So order breaks down as we have seen it in the crowd disasters. While the other regarding optimization itself, regulation is actually performing that's all over the full range of capacity utilization. So there is a better way of control. Bottom-up self-regulation can actually outsmart optimal top-down control, and that's quite surprising. And the invisible hand works even at high utilization. So here you can see actually how beautiful green waves are resulting from this self-regulation principle that, by the way, was inspired by oscillatory flows of pedestrian uh, bottlenecks. So, but do actually other regarding decision makers exist? Is the homo economic, uh, homo socialis actually out there? And could we come up with something like a self-regulating traffic light control for our society or eco economy? That's an exciting question. But let me come back to Adam Smith. He was actually aware of the social nature of man. In his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, he said, however selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render the happiness necessary to him though he derives nothing from it. And actually, experiments of my colleague Ryan Murphy are underlining this. Well, there are some individualistic decision makers a la homo economics, but the great majority of people have a pro-social way of deciding. And then the question is, however, what kind of institutions do we need to support this kind of social other regarding decision makers because anonymous homogeneous exchange is actually uh, undermining cooperation and social behavior. <laughs> so a homo socialis would turn into a homo economicus in principle because he behaves conditionally cooperative and if others don't cooperate then homo socialis also doesn't cooperate. So we, how can we support social cooperation of the homo socialis? And I think reputation systems is one of the possible approaches to reach it. And in fact, they're spreading like wildfire in the web. They must be useful for something. And it turns out it's good, not just for customers who get a better service and feel co more comfortable about deals they make, it's also good for sellers because they can sell products at a higher price if they have a good reputation. However, we need to make sure that those reputation systems would be pro, pro, uh, pluralistic because we don't want a situation where everybody is buying the same product, is listening to the same music, is going to the same movie. That would terribly reduce social diversity, but social diversity is as important as biodiversity. Social diversity is the driver of innovation, but also happiness and societal resilience. It's important. So we need to make sure that we have pluralistic information ecosystems, and we, this can be reached by allowing people to mine rating data themselves, to come up with their own reputation filters, to configure them, share them with others, modify them, and so on. So they would create this ecosystem of filters that would allow us to get more and more out of the data that we are producing all the time. So <coughs> it's very important that we pay attention to the relevance of difference, a diversity, it has a big value. We know that uh, the economy and the society are a little bit like ecosystems. They wouldn't work if everybody was the same. So we need different kinds of players. And uh, we need to learn how to handle diversity. And uh, participatory bottom-up approach seems to be the right way 
And I think that social media can very much support actually this kind of approach. So I'm closing with the appeal that we have a lot of global problems and they call for a joint and a global effort and interdisciplinary as well. And we need to create now new institutions for the 21st century. In the same way as we have created institutions in the past, like public roads, public schools, public libraries, public universities, and so on. And I believe that open, transparent information systems will be those infrastructures of the 21st century. But we shouldn't forget that all of this, the complexity of those network systems we are creating, are creating a different kinds of dynamics in the system and that requires us to change the way of our thinking. We've seen that as the complexity of systems increases, a top-down control is not doing the best job anymore. A bottom-up approach can be superior and that means more participation. And what does it really mean for a problem like global warming, for example? We've seen that for many years, governments all over the world are struggling to find an agreement on regulations that they could finally enforce. Global warming is progressing quickly. Uh, before we said it would be 2 degrees centigrade. Now we are afraid it might be even 4 degrees of centigrade. So there is a need to do something, but we can't agree to do it in a top-down way. So why don't we do it in a bottom-up way and, and make something like a climate Olympics in, say, cities like Zurich, who are committed to a 2,000-watt society, and they could team up with other cities. I mean, after all, most of energy is spent in cities. So the solution to the global warming problem is lying within the cities. If now just we come up with an alliance of cities who want to do something, like Singapore also sees that they need to do something. So I'm sure it can be hundreds of cities that could build such an alliance and tackle the problem bottom up. That is the paradigm shift. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Yeah, Margie. Um, yeah, I just a, a question about the issue of big data. I mean, it, there's no doubt that you know social cooperation is important, but isn't the real problem um, just learning how to model big data in complex systems? And you know, if you go back to the financial crisis, um, a lot of the people that work in internal physics are going to say, "Well, the problem with that is that." You know, you've got all of these with computers doing the trading and with all of the financial data that's stored, you get these complex correlations and or sort of large numbers of correlations, large numbers of, uh, of uh, interactions that need to be taken account of. And so the problem is that the models model those on a sort of normal Gaussian distribution and didn't take account of the, the issue of what's under the fat tails. And so it's, it's really a modeling problem. So instead of using Black-Scholes, which uses you know, mean field theory, you have to use something else. So you have to model it on using renal motivation group equations or something like that. So it's the way, so the problem comes not just from a lack of social cooperation, but also from a knowledge of, of actually how to model these complex systems. What's the right mathematical framework for modeling the system? So, you know, I don't think you're ever going to get away from having that large amount of data in the financial market, but the question is how do you treat it? And even if you've got social cooperation, you're still not going to get the right answers or the, the desirable output unless you have the right way to model it mathematically. Right, thank you. That was a very good point. Uh, it's very much appealing for a complexity thinking, a complexity approach towards modeling which hasn't always been done in the past. And I think this is, in fact, a problem, that uh, there is still a lot of linear thinking around in decision-making. And complexity science didn't make it, really, into many study directions. They should be all physics and 
chemistry and biology and engineering, electrical and mechanical engineering, even history, um, social science, um, psychology. It's relevant for all those disciplines, but it hasn't become part yet of the education of future decision makers. And I think that's why we understand the world in the wrong way and take the, the wrong conclusions about how to go about the problems. Um, in that respect, I agree. Uh, I don't want to minimize, um, however, the, the problem of finally specifying the models. You know, uh, I mean, once you go from linear to non-linear models, then you have a large range of possibilities. So somehow your modeling universe is opening up, and that makes it uh, technically complicated to identify the right kind of, of model. So now in economics, more and more economists recognize that uh, maybe the models that have been using in the past are not doing a sufficiently good job. And there are all sorts of generalizations going away from the home economicus in one direction or or another, but there are a hundred or a thousand ways of doing it. So <laughs> there's not yet any agreement on what would be the alternative model that we should work with in the future. But certainly one, one of the problems in, I know, established mainstream economics is that there was a limited interest in data and, and not much use of big data apart from the financial traders, of course, we have always been dealing with a lot of people. Um, yeah, two things. <clears throat> I very much like this uh, approach to see financial crisis and other things like a design problem to allow for more self-regulation. And I think you gave very nice examples, traffic example, where it works very well. But first, as a general uh, solution to problems, even the financial crisis, I would be I I'm a little bit more cautious because it has a tendency to be conservative. I mean, we, we look at how we can keep the, the current system, um, allow for self-regulation, but we don't allow for other systems, but especially connects to what you said at the end. You want to allow for some more um, diversity, but right. what diversity do we want? Do we want to allow for non-democratic societies? I mean, there's a whole range out there, which I think just your models can't capture, which they don't need to, but I think it's good to be cautious. And the other thing is also um, maybe also something I'm not so clear about because in the talk before we heard a lot how difficult it is to measure things like temperature, which seem to be much easier to me than uh, to measure cooperations between people. Of course, the internet can give us some proxies for that, but um, I don't know how well this um, is already reflected in econophysics, this debate on yeah, problems of observational data. So. Yeah, so I'm not arguing here for econophysics or social physics. I think there, there is a need to bring different methods together across disciplinary boundaries. And it's important that we recognize the value of each different approach. And uh, so our approach is bringing together data mining, modeling, computer simulation, and experiments, and in principle you could also use um, serious multiplayer online games and other new settings in order to find out more about how people decide, and you could build virtual worlds you know, to basically try out different options before you choose one and implement it. Altogether, there are many new opportunities here, also scientific opportunities, uh, opportunities that we can test certain implementations and designs to a certain extent before we implement them and thereby maybe avoid a number of mistakes and take better decisions altogether. I certainly don't want to suggest that uh, traffic models and uh, how to overcome traffic jams can just be translated one to one to society or the organization of our economy. I'm just choosing these kinds of examples because everybody can imagine them well. If you have a look at our work, 
um, country coordination, cooperation, social norms, and many other things. And we'll notice these are different models, sometimes even different methods that we're using in order to uh, be <coughs> fair to the difference of those systems. And also the suggestions we are developing or to improve those systems are very different. Like the, the traffic assistance system would not be transferred to a financial market. For the financial market, we have other ideas what could be done. But one of the problems that seems to be there is that we don't have enough diversity. We have one financial system. We don't have a backup, a second financial system, a third one, or a number of sy financial systems that compete with each other. I think that would be certainly beneficial for a number of reasons. Um, and we're thinking about other kinds of financial architectures that could actually be brought up in parallel to what we have. So that you would have a backup system. So the attempt uh, that we're doing is basically to develop new concepts, to have alternatives in case the way we're doing things today is failing. And it could very well happen. Now. And there is no time then basically to develop something. So we need to have it ready made in our folders so we can take it out and implement it right away. And uh, I think you know, we, we, we should do that. Uh, we should be much more diverse in the approaches that we take in order to study, for example, economic uh, systems and possible solutions. So we don't have just one solution, but we have different options to choose from. That's certainly a wise thing to do. Um, back to the, the traffic uh, solutions. Uh, assuming we had a system that would work just like in the VW animation with the uh, automated velocity or, or distance uh, regulation, and at the same time you had these intelligent uh, crossings where the, where the traffic lights would, would work automatically according to some optimized algorithm. Uh, can, you ex can you make sure on theoretical grounds that these two independent algorithms wouldn't interact in a way to create under certain conditions the mother of all traffic jams, just like independent trading algorithms create the financial meta? Um, I'm not concerned about the interaction of those two systems. A another interesting question is now what happens if this system adjusts to the driver and the driver at the same time adjusts to the system. And then, then the crucial thing is does it happen on the same time scale or does it happen on different time scales? If it happens on the same time scale, then that could cause problems. And these kind of questions need to be addressed, of course. If it's happening on different time scales, then I think it will sort out nicely. But in fact, um, uh, and this is uh, the reason why we need many more complexity scientists. Each system is different when it becomes nonlinear and requires different models and requires also different ways of going about problems. That means you cannot use one schema F and transfer it from one system to another easily. And that, that's why we why I believe we need to really raise more students that have complexity thinking and the methods at hand basically to apply them to the problems they will find in the future when they work in this company or for that government or whatever. Perhaps can you tell us a little bit more about the connection between those kinds of risks, systemic risks, local network risks and probabilities. So, I mean, is it possible to quantify the risk using probabilities and if not, what is the reasonable challenge there? When I entered uh, the field of modeling disasters and systemic risks, I found it, to be honest, quite a bit frustrating because you could come up with models, but 
but um, when you wanted to basically empirically calibrate them, <coughs> then you would need a lot of data, and uh, it was unimaginable to ever have these kind of data in the past when I started uh, with this research field. Now, however, uh, I do think actually that it becomes within grasp to measure those things. It will take a number of years, but uh, just remember the Internet of Things is in front of our door and will be cheap to equip uh, our technology with sensors that give us the kind of information that we need about the state of the system. So we might be able really to overcome this. There could be a, a paradigm shift here that allows us to become much more quantitative and, and practical than, than we could be in the past. Yeah, I can stop any question of my own here. So I wonder if you could tell us something about the mechanism behind this pattern in non-correlation or in cooperation that you showed. So it, it goes up first mm -hmm. and then it falls down. Oh, but what's the explanation for this? I mean, why is this happening? We know that in the social dilemma situations, <laughs> uh, prisoner's dilemma is, is one of those kinds of situations, um, the mean field behavior is uh, described by the replicator equation. Mm -hmm. And that implies that cooperation is unstable because of the kind of payoff matrix that is underlying the game. And it means if either people interact randomly with each other or everybody interacts with everybody else, and that are the cases where the replicator equation applies, we know that uh, cooperation will disappear. So basically, the issue of uh, civilizations is that they have to come up with ways to create social order and cooperation. And, uh, Societies have come up with a number of different mechanisms to enable cooperation, such as uh, reciprocity or, or also punishment of non-cooperative behavior, also uh, clustering, um, neighborhood interactions, uh, is one of the mechanisms that is actually allowing cooperation to thrive. That's why when we, as long as we have kind of the local interactions here, we have an increase of cooperation. But reputation is again another mechanism that is supporting cooperation. And that is the reason actually why I'm proposing reputation systems as a solution for the globalized village. It's kind of transferring the success principle of uh, local organizations to the globalized world. And I think it's worth trying, we should build these kind of systems because it's certainly something that uh, is more promising and probably more supported by people than the kind of surveillance systems that are being grown by governments in all over the world at the moment. Okay, um, thank you very much for a wonderful talk.